Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Phil Jones. Um, I am part of the Sign Edit training team, and I am working. Um, we are going going to be talking about HDMI 2.1 today. So we're going to give it a few more minutes before we get started. I wish we had music that we could just play along as we wait. If during the session you have problems with your audio um, and you're using your computer, we suggest that maybe you switch to a phone. So we, we had a large group last um, during the last session and a few people, maybe about a dozen or so had problems with audio. And if that's a problem, we suggest that you maybe switch to your phone in order to, um, to hopefully that will fix the problem. So one more minute before we get started. Countdown to HDMI 2.1. So good morning, everyone. My name is Phil Jones, and we're here to talk about HDMI 2.1. Now, we only have about an hour, and, and it will take hours and hours just to cover every single topic or every single question you will have. But the goal is to give you an overview of 2.1 and how does it work and can you, can you utilize old equipment and what type of cables do you need, um, all that type of stuff, and even why is there this, this format out here. So what happens is if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the questions um, um, area um, on your screen. You'll see a little um, I, a place where you can type in questions. And hopefully during the presentation, I will answer those questions. And if not, we will go through at the end and do a, a Q&A at the end to try to cover as many as possible. Any questions we do not get to, during the session, we will um, try to get back to you with a kind of an FA, um, a Q and A um, sheet that actually answers all of the questions that were put into the um, into the question panel below. So, who am I? Um, my name is um, Phil Jones. I am the um, I am the director of training for Sound United. And Sound United is a conglomeration of brands, a whole bunch of brands that you know and love. Um, Denon, Morantz, Class A, Definitive Technology, Polk Audio. And um, so, and I have a, a, a long um, history of being involved in the audio video industry. And a lot of it has to do, and I spent a lot of time on the video side. So people ask me a lot about things such as HDR, 4K, um, HDMI certifications and things like that. So I wanted to take some time and, and discuss those with you. So the first thing we get asked is why do we have another specification? Seems like every time I turn around, there's something new. HDMI 1.4B, um, HDMI 2.0A, HDMI 2.0B, HDMI 2.1. So we get asked a lot um, about these different specifications. And so we wanna go in here and we want to explain to you um, why there's the, the, why did they actually do this? And a lot of it has to do with, with um, uh, enhancements to try to make the user experience better. And for example, <clears throat> better video, better audio, enhanced gaming, as well as a better user experience. Now, all of these things are a benefit of this new specification 2.1. Um, but 
the main reason why we need a new cable and, and it, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to install is because for the video enhancements, there is going to require more bandwidth. You need more bandwidth. So in order to understand why you need more bandwidth for the video side of, the, of, the, of this whole um, new specification, we have to first talk about or, and go through what makes up video. So if I look at this, I can go in and video is made up of basically um, five basic elements. Yes, there's more. We could talk about color subsampling and all of these other things, but these are pretty much the main things that you will hear and see listed. And, um, and so we want to talk about these five um, basic elements of video. Resolution, frame rate, color depth, brightness range, and color space. So, oh, sorry here, uh, keep going. So what makes up these things? The first thing, image resolution. Um, resolution, of course, is going to make it bigger. It's like looking at a photo. Um, a photo. A eight meg photo is going to be, ooh, is going to be um, um, uh, bigger than a two meg photo. So as I make each photo bigger, I have more pixels of information and each particular frame gets larger. So if you go from HD, which is 2 million pixels, to 8K, which is 33 million pixels, or for you camera people, 33 megapixels. So I go from two megapixel photograph to a 33 megapixel photograph, the file size is going to be bigger, about 16 times bigger. And that's for each frame. The next thing that can really expand the uh, the size of a file is its um, is resolution, motion resolution. How many frames are we actually are we actually using in order to do this? So so those types of things will increase it. For example, if I go from uh, 24 frames to um, 30 frames per second to 120 frames per second, it's just more. Um, files in the, it's this more size of the video format. If I only have 24 frames um, uh, per second for an hour, that file size is going to be one size. If I quadruple that amount of frames or add four times as many frames, it's just reasonable that the video file is going to get bigger. So a larger, more detailed picture and more of the pictures increases the size of the file. The next, oops, oh, I'm sorry, the last one we want to cover was color depth. Color depth, think of that as shades of colors. So um, how many shades of red, how many shades of green, how many shades of blue? 8-bit, um, it gives you a certain amount of shades that you can use. 256 shades of red, 256 shades of green, 256 shades of blue. When you multiply that together, you get a total of 16 million colors you could make. By moving up two bits, you go from 16 million colors to a billion colors. And going up two more bits, you go from 1 billion to 68 billion. But when you add more bit depth, you make the file size bigger. So these three things are the main reasons why most video files get larger. We'll talk about another one later called color subsampling, which is 422 and 444 and 420 later. But these are the main ones that you normally hear most about, 4K 60p at 10 bit which is what you normally hear when you look at your specifications. So if we look at these five elements of video, um, you have five of them. So all five of these are part of whether you're looking at SDR video, HDR video, um, any um, regular 4K, it does not matter. These two, color space and brightness range, really do not expand the size, make the file size bigger. It's just a different way of communicating the information. So let's take a look. The first thing, color space. Color space is basically, or color gamut, is the, um, the uh, amount of colors or the color shades that I can use those numbers to represent. So basically I have, um, there's different size triangles you'll see. The, uh, if I have eight bit, I have two. I have 256 numbers that I can express green. So if the triangle gets smaller, larger, whatever, 8-bit means I still have the same amount of numbers. 
So color gamut is just the size of the triangle, and then you use the bit depth, the number of colors you can select to determine where in those triangles can I pick the colors. So expanding a color gamut does not expand the file size. Um, um, adding more shades that you can select from in that color gamut using bit depth affects the file size. The next thing is brightness range. And you hear that's the part that you hear most about HDR. Zero to 100 nits, which is how um, brightness was measured, is what standard dynamic range is. Going up to 10,000 nits means you have 100 times the brightness range, the level of brightness as you can select to represent um, Ferrari in the shadow, to, uh, Ferrari red in the shadows, to Ferrari red in the sunset. By adding more brightness range, you um, can bind with color gamut, you get more color volume. We're used to seeing that little two-dimensional graph on the left side of the screen here, but color is more represented these days as a cube. By combining brightness and combining um, uh, color gamut, you get a bigger cube of colors. And that is what makes HDR look so much better. So as you um, increase the color gamut and you increase the brightness, the cubes get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that is what gives HDR its lovely, lifelike, vibrant image that you normally see. And as I mentioned, increasing the brightness and, and picking a different color gamut to pick the colors from does not make the file size any bigger. Now, when we go back to this and we say, which element um, are being enhanced by 2.1? So you have all five of these elements. Which are the ones that are that they're pumping up for 2.1? And pretty much there's only two. We're adding more resolution capabilities, 8K 60, or and more frame rate. Um, currently you're hearing 4K 120. Both of those numbers actually HDMI 2.1 can actually ex exceed that, and I'll show you um, in a chart a little later. But the main ones you hear is 8K resolution and 120 frame, um, frames per second. Those are the two things that they're working on. Both of those enhance your resolution, what you see, your clarity. Um, uh, 8K is a frame of resolution, uh, resolution um, when an object is not in motion. Frame rate increases the motion resolution. It reduces the amount of blur and increases your motion clarity as you increase the amount of frames that you're using. So we go to these shows and I walked around um, the last two CESs and I keep an 8K, 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 or F or HFR, F, HFR, high frame rate. Those are the two things that everybody talked about. Um, manuf TV manufacturers love it. Why well, I take four, basically I take four um, 42 inch 4K TVs and instead of cutting those four, taking that, um, I combine those four um, TVs into one big sheet of glass and now I have a um, 84 inch 8K TV. So um, the ability to um, offer a bigger TV with higher resolution um, is good, is the, the TV manufacturers love it. Um, why? Even if there's no content, because if people thought 4K was better than HD, then obviously if they walk into a store and you see 8K on something, you're more likely to upgrade from that 4K to an 8K, they hope. So 8K is what is being promoted the most, as well as high frame rate, for, especially for gaming. Um, higher frame rates make gaming, makes the gaming experience better, um, more lifelike and more fluid. And um, so those are the two things that are promoted the most. But there's more to HDMI 2.1 than just 8K and high frame rate. Things to enhance the user experience um, and also the audio experience. So let's go through and look at um, these different um, extra benefits to HDMI 2.1. The first thing, features that enhance gaming mostly. Now, could you utilize, could these also enhance a movie experience? It's possible. But a couple of these are pretty much designed for gaming. So um, variable refresh rate. If you're playing a game, um, you, instead, of, instead of setting your computer 
or your gaming system to output at 60 frames per second, and everything is output at 60 frames per second, the computer or the gaming system will vary its refresh rate. But why would you want to do that? Well, if I have a person standing in the jungle in a, in a first person shooter game and he's not moving, there's no reason to refresh that scene 60 or 120 times a second. So what I can do is I can take the computer can refresh it at maybe 14 or 24 or 36 times a second or 60 frames a second and spend the, the extra processing power to make a sharper image. Once I start moving and bullets are flying and, and weapons are flying and laser beams are flying, um, now I will increase my frame rate to make that motion clear. Um, so, the, um, so the benefit of this is you get a much sharper, clearer image with less lag and less frame tear tearing. So the, the experience is fluid and more detailed because the computer can optimize each scene and each um, every second to get you the best experience. So the, 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 the game system has to output this and the TV has to know what to do with it. The next thing. Quick frame uh, transport, just another way to reduce the amount of la um, latency to make um, less lag. Um, and when you combine that with what's called auto low latency mode, the goal is to make the game as smooth and lag free as possible. Game lag is what gets you, is what gets you killed in a video game. If I have game lag and you do not, and we both come around the corner at the same time, you will see me before I see you and um, I'm dead. So the lower we can get the lag down on video gaming, the better the experience and the more competitive you can be as a gamer. So auto low latency ensures that the system will do it automatically. And we'll talk about these little bit, more, all of these a little bit more as we continue on. Now there's also some features that enhance movies and video as well as gaming. Okay, the first one, enhanced audio return channel. This is, um, you have a HDMI cable connected to your TV and um, that is, uh, from your receiver. Well, the game, the TV may have an internal streaming service or the device connected to it. It can use the, the TV can use that same cable that's connected between the AVR and the TV to send the signal video signal to the TV to send audio signal from the TV back to the AVR. And this audio signal, it's called audio return channel ARC. EARC is an enhanced version of it. Um, uh, it. Because there's more bandwidth or more capabilities, you can have uncompressed surround sound from the streaming services or devices connected to your TV. Basically the same quality sound as if you had a 4K Blu-ray. So if Netflix or somebody else decides they wanna, they, that, which they are actually deciding, they're cranking up the quality of their audio, the audio output will be, can be as good off of those streaming services, Netflix, Amazon, Disney Plus, as it would be if you were watching that, that movie off of a 4K Blu-ray. Definitely an enhancement to anybody that is into movies, video, or, or anything else that has audio. The next one, quick media switching. This is beneficial to what, what, um, whether you're gaming, video, movies, whatever. We've all seen it where when you're switching from one format to another, maybe an, uh, a, a, um, a 480p channel to a 1080p channel or a 1080p channel to a 4K channel or an SDR standard dynamic range to high dynamic range, you get that blank of the screen. The screen goes black for a second while everything communicates. You know, Well, the goal is to eliminate that. So when you switch from channel to channel or source to source, it's quicker with less delay. It's a better experience. Customers don't like to wait. Um, Jason's asking, is there any broadcasting and streaming? We will get, we will actually get to that. And of course, for those who are asking, this video will be shared. So we are going to, we are recording this video. Hopefully Jen is recording this video. And, um, and um, we will share this video at the end for those people who are curious and would like to watch this again or have someone else watch it. Okay, it says this video is being, this session is being recorded. So yes, it's being recorded. I just want to verify, <laughs> right? The next thing, so we go back here. The next thing, 
um, there's advantages to high dynamic range. High dynamic range um, um, has existed for a while. So, um, but there's some other parts to high dynamic range. Um, part of the specification also says that you should be able to support dynamic metadata. Dynamic metadata, so we'll talk about, let's talk about metadata and then what dynamic metadata is and why you can already support my dynamic metadata right now. So the first thing, um, many TVs cannot reproduce all of the brightness and all of the color that is in a HDR signal. So what happens is on the file, there is metadata to one, tell the, t the TV the, to switch to HDR mode, and two, give the TV some information about the movie or the video so it can adapt itself to, uh, to get the most out of the HDR signal. So the first thing, there is a flag to switch to, called an infra frame to switch the TV. Then there is metadata. And that metadata normally is, when it comes to static metadata, the brightest pixel in the movie and the and the um, the um, the average brightness of the brightest frame in the movie. So it looks at what's the brightest pixel in the movie. So say it's a pixel in that Harrison Ford scene, and that is um, 2,500 nits. Then it says what's the brightest frame in the movie, and it says what's well, this frame with Harrison Ford, and it says what's the average brightness of that frame, and it says if you have look at all the pixels in that frame, the average brightness of that frame is 400 nits. So the TV uses that information to try to adapt itself and tone map, it's called tone mapping, to get the most out of the set. The problem is when you watch a movie, there's bright scenes and there's dark scenes. So if I try to use the information that static metadata is only based on this one frame in time on a different scene in that movie, such as the scene to the left, the 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 signal is not, it's not optimized to get, the TV's not really optimized to do it its very best. Dynamic metadata, each frame is, um, information is shared. So as the, t the TV gets new information for each frame, so we can determine what's the best way to, um, to tone map itself. Sometimes the information is shared with the TV and the TV makes a decision. Sometimes it's, the, uh, the system, Dolby Vision, tells the TV exactly how to optimize itself frame by frame by frame. The benefit is you get a better looking picture, whether it's a dark scene, bright scene, every scene is optimized. Now, this is part of the HDMI 2.1 specification. However, there's already formats out there, um, HDR10+, Plus, which is a derivative of HDR10, and Dolby Vision, which is also um, um, are both dynamic metadata um, uh, versions that are already available today. Many of these um, um, things that are part of the HDMI certification means you must do them in order to have or support them in order to be an HDMI 2.1 certified device. It does not mean an older device cannot. Um, cannot do it. It just means that it's not that in order to get this nice certification, you have to have it. And that is why it is a lot of the receivers that you have now and a lot of the products you have now, video displays are already supporting some of these convenience features and some of these performance features that are available in um, HDMI 2.1. So the next question people says, well, like we were talking about, oh my God, I, did, I have all these components, um, TVs, projectors, cables, um, sources. What am I going to do with all of those? You know, um, um, what about that AVR? Should I wait? And because to um, so the customer, or should I wait as a customer because I, I bought an 8K TV for um, instead of getting a great new home theater system now or AVR now? Well, let's talk about that. The first thing, um, many 2.1 features, as I mentioned. Are, have already been adopted by companies like us, Denon and Marex. So while these are, you have to do it for a 2.1 display, it does um, um, product, it does not mean an older HDMI 1.4B or an HDMI 2.0B display cannot do it. So for example, eARC and auto low latency mode. Let's look at each one of these. The, the first thing, eARC. 
eARC, like we said, gives you that uncompressed um, audio from uh, in surround sound. Like if I go back here, you get um, Dolby True HD and DTS Master Audio. The best version of uh, of Dolby and the best version of DTS in Atmos and DTSX. So you get immersive 3D audio with, at its highest quality, which is like a like a 4K Blu-ray. So if you look here, when it comes to aud enhanced audio return channel, we've supported regular audio return channel forever, but enhanced audio return channel, we have been supporting, we have products since 2018 that have supported it. So for example, Denon um, X85, uh, Denon X3500 and above support it in 20, um, 2018. So 4,500, um, 6,500, et cetera. Um, also, Marantz, 6013 and above, um, 8012s, et cetera, also support eARC. Um, this year, in, um, in last year in 2019, we have actually added eARC support to the majority of our um, AVRs. The, um, the only two that you don't see that are, um, that are supported are two, um, uh, two channel receivers that happen to have HDMI switching. But pretty much everything else supports um, eARC or audio return channel from a 650, AVR 650 all the way up to an X8500. Um, you have um, eARC support right now. So you can take advantage of that feature right now. The next thing is auto low latency mode. We talked about auto low latency mode. In order for this to work, um, you have a source, a repeater, and a sync. The source is says, I am playing a game. It is the job of the repeater to pass that information to the sync, the display. So an, an AVR, a receiver, is always a repeater. The repeater it takes the information, it pulls off the audio and sends the video information and the rest of the information to the sync. It repeats. A repeater can not only be an AVR, it can also be a, uh, a matrix switcher or even an HDMI balance. So in auto low latency mode, say I am watching Netflix on my PlayStation um, the, or my Xbox. The receiver has all of its enhancements on, whether it's scaling, audio, um, auto lip sync. The TV has all of its um, cool video processing on. The second I switch the game system, to a game, the game says, I am playing a game. And immediately it will alert the repeater, which will switch to its low latency mode and pass the information to the TV. So it switches to its low latency mode. So what you end up with is the best gaming experience and the best video experience and the devices will switch to those modes automatically. You as a user, um, your customers, do not have to deal with it. It does it automatically. It enhances the experience. And this is available on a lot of our products right now. How many? If we look at auto low latency mode, we actually have products um, that were introduced in 2014 that actually support um, auto low latency mode. So you already have two things to enhance your audio experience from streaming services, and you, and you already have Another one to enhance your gaming. And these things already exist in receivers right now. So a lot of this um, capabilities are, are available to you today. And we already talked about dynamic, um, uh, dynamic HDR, uh, dynamic metadata for HDR. Dolby Vision has been supported by, um, for a while on, on our AVRs and on a lot of other devices. So moving on. The next question we get asked, well, what about this 48 uh, uh, gigabits per second? Do I, um, am I gonna need it? Um, do I need it now? Um, when will I need it is the next question we get asked or I get asked a lot. So I wanna give you some basic facts so you can understand when you or your customer is, are going to need to, to really step up to something that has 48 gigabit video switching inside. So let's first talk about a few facts I want you to understand. The first thing, there are no currently no HDMI 2.1 movie sources or available. So physical media, there is no disc. Um, the current 4K Blu-ray does not have the bandwidth capabilities to support 8K, 1, 8K 60 or 4K 120. 
uh, they would have to come up with a whole new compression scheme or a new laser for that di for a new disk to end up with a new physical media. So the current disk won't support it. The next thing is there's no standalone streaming devices that have been announced. So that means like 4K, like Roku's or Apple TVs. And finally, there's no um, satellite or cable set top boxes. They are doing some testing for AK set top boxes, set top boxes in Japan for the Olympics, but the majority of set top boxes currently do not support. And and while and there is kind of a chicken and egg thing going on here too, because it most ma manufacturers aren't motivated to design a physical media or come up with standalone devices or come up with channels unless there is content. So studios are not shooting their content. They may capture it in, in, um, in 8K, but it's mastered at the most in 4K. That is because movie theaters are 4K displays. So I'm not gonna spend double the money to master a movie in 8K when I can't play it in the movie theater where I make a billion dollars on Avengers. So there's no motive, the, the studios are not as motivated to make 8K content. The same thing with um, broadcast content, whether it's TV shows or things like that. Most of the major studios, there's nothing to play it on, so they're not really motivated to make 8K content. And finally, the cable providers and the satellite providers. It, to, to, take, to make one 4K channel, I have to give up two HD channels. And we see how many 4K channels you have now because you don't have very many because it looks better for a cable provider to say they have 200 channels instead of saying they have 50 4K channels. So many cable providers and satellite providers or broadcasters are hesitant to give up the bandwidth for 4K to go from, a, to go from HD to 8K, you would have to give up 16 channels. And most cable providers are hesitant to do that. So they may eventually do some one or two special events, but right now there's not a lot of content and there's not a lot of motivation for them to make content. <clears throat> Could this change? Absolutely. But that is the state right now. So don't expect all of a sudden um, tomorrow there's gonna be 50, 50 2.1 source devices because that's not really the case. There are gonna be future gaming systems coming out. Um, PlayStation and Xbox will definitely support it, but there's a way to get that signal to your traditional AVR right now. You basically plug the game system, your new brand new shiny game system into your new shiny 8K TV or HDMI 2.1 TV. And then you would send the audio from that from the TV playing the video game to your receiver via ARC, the HDMI cable that's already connected. And I'll show you a graph on, I'll show you a chart on that a little bit later or an illustration of that a little bit later. Finally, the probably the first places where you're going to get content is going to be streaming. That is where the first, a lot of the first 4K content came from, streaming from services like Netflix and Amazon and Disney Plus, who were trying to build a, a reason for you to subscribe to them instead of just having cable. So you may see some services coming from internal streaming services by the majors or maybe sponsored by companies like Sony or Samsung. Um, so their, t their 8K TVs actually have 8K content. If that is the case, the streaming service is built into the TV. So you would send the content, the audio from that streaming service that is built into the TV back to the receiver using eARC. So the video never touches the AVR. So, um, so guess what? You can still utilize your AVR. So is there a rush to buy a new AVR because of just because of 48 gigabits? Maybe not. So we talked about these gaming systems. These are gonna be the one things that we know are going to support 8K up to 60 frames per second and 4K up to 120 frames per second. Um, interesting. After talking to a lot of gamers and going on all the forums, um, many most gamers are more interested in the high frame rate than the 8K resolution. Higher frame rates, 120 frames per second, makes for a smoother 
gaming experience, when you have these fast action things going on, a smoother, clearer image makes you a better shot. So they would rather have more frames than less high resolution frames. Many of the game developers are focusing more on the 4K 120 aspect of it, but you will see some 8K games up to 60 frames per second just to show that they can do it. But many people you'll start seeing, you'll see a lot more high frame rate versions of the games in maybe 4K HDR at 120 frames per second with variable refresh rates and things like that. So there are these new game systems coming in. So what if I wanna take advantage of that? Well, right now it's simple. You take the game system, you buy yourself a new ultra high speed rated or HDMI, which is the, the certain name. Ultra high speed HDMI is the name, um, the actual uh, uh, approved name for an HDMI 2.1 certified cable. So I would take my game system and I would plug it into my TV, my 2.1 game system plugged into my 2.1 TV using this new 2.1 certified cable. And I get to take advantage of all of the great things that are available in 2.1. Um, 4K 120, 4, uh, 8K 60, variable refresh rates, auto, auto low latency mode, everything goes right into the TV. Then it, I would um, send the audio backwards to the um, AVR using um, my, uh, the, the standard HDMI cable that is already connected to the that you that 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 you already have that you was that was connected from your AVR that you already have to your TV. This make sure you get a good one, a good 18 gigabit one with with um, with Ethernet. You'll see HDMI with Ethernet. Make sure you get a good cable. Most good cables have that, and you can pass it H um, EARC back and forth, EARC audio back to the receiver, and all of the video from your 4K devices and your cable box and your Roku, Roku 4K and your and your 4K Blu-ray player, you can send that to the TV and the TV will upscale it from 4K to 8K, simple. So until there is multiple external 2.1 sources, there is no rush to upgrade a uh, Denon Amaranth AVR. You can use the one you have today. Now, newer ones coming down the pipeline will have the switching already built in. Why? Why not? But I'm telling you right now, if you buy or you own a great Denon or Marantz AVR and you bought it in the last year or so, that piece will be able to live in your system for a very long time, including many of the cables that you already own. So, um, the next question is, what if a customer, what if I want to be prepared for HDMI 2.1? What if I want it right now? And I, I don't want, and I'm worried that if I buy a receiver, I may end up with 17 sources. I may have a, so for that customer that says he's going to buy an Xbox and a PlayStation and a gaming PC and, and some $20,000 thing that comes out that is the first device externally that, it, that plays back 8K, do we have a solution? Yes, we do. If you, um, Denon and Marantz both have solutions. Uh, the Denon flagship AVR receiver, the X8500, and the Marantz um, AV Pre-Pro, the, the 8805, can both be upgraded to 2.1. Right now it has an HDMI 2.0B board in it. Um, when the, we will offer a board replacement or a board upgrade. So basically when there is some sources to play and the customer finally decides that he has enough sources that he wants to utilize the switching built into the receiver to switch multiple HDMI 2.1 sources, he can send the receivers to our service facility. In the US it is in upper, up, I think it's upstate New York and for a fee, we will upgrade, we'll pull out the old board and replace it with a HDMI 2.1 compatible video board for all of your switching and on-screen menus and everything else. Um, the timing and price has, has not been announced, but we are, we, have, uh, we are going to do this. So you can buy these receivers. You can buy this receiver and you can buy this AVR now because these are our flagship hero products for both Denon and Marantz and know that you don't have to replace it in a year or so or two years or so or three years when there is a bunch of 2.1 sources. So we have you covered. 
But in the meantime, um, you know, a lot of people will probably, it'll go a long time, even if they have these before they replace. If they don't have a video game, if they're not a gamer, they're out. If they don't, they're not really going to be concerned. If they're a gamer or all of a sudden a bunch of sources come, they have peace of mind. So what about the cables? We get asked a lot about the cables. Am I going to have to replace every cable in my system? What cables still work? And um, what do I need to know about cables? So we could spend an hour just talking about cables, but I want to cover a couple of quick things. Um, just so you understand what's going on in the cable and how a lot of cables you have, you could probably continue to use. They won't be certified 2.1, but it's a chance that they will still work in a 2.1 environment. So let's take a look inside of a cable. So there's lots of wires and things going on in this cable with lots of different signals going through. In fact, there's 19 different wires um, go inside of a single HDMI cable. The ones we want you to look at and be concerned with is the first thing are what are called those TMDS pairs. Those are the where the signal is sent. Yeah, okay, those are where the signal is, um, is being um, sent from. Uh, and there's normally three of those. Um, three signal wires. Then there's also what's called a clock pair. This is used just to send timing. And then there's some other things that you would send your audio, your your metadata information, your 12 volts to to um, to to, um, to power a, a device, your um, your CEC, your control signal for so your TV can control a sound bar or something like that. Um, that is what's inside of this cable. Um, somebody's asking a realistic maximum link. We'll get to that. And um, when you talk about good table cables, we will get to that. So let's continue on. So inside of this cable, we talk about all these wires. The ones we want you to be interested in are the ones right in the middle that are called TMDS. Um, these are where the signal, the video signal is done. And right now they are using three of them to send the video signal. There is another TMDS, which is the clock channel. Right now it's just used for timing. And then you have all your other stuff for CEC and things like that. Uh, and this is how our cable is used up that is certified up to 2.0B. This is how the regular, that specification works right now. But what they did is now they're taking that clock channel and they're going to make that clock channel a fourth channel to send video. So instead of sending using three of the TMS channels, I'm, I have four channels that I can use, which is why it needs you need in order to do this. You need um, it requires some hardware changes to the video switching of the board to get these higher bandwidths and use our four channels for this particular purpose. So right now you have three of the four channels and an HDMI cable is currently used to carry the signal, and the fourth um, channel is reserved for timing. Each of the channels right now. Um, are rated or certified to carry six gigabits per second. So which is where you get the 18 gigabits that you hear about for HDMI 2.0B. An 18, an 18 gigabit um, is the spec. Doesn't mean it can't do more than that, but it had to be able to do at least that to be an HDMI 2.0B certified um, cable. When you go to 2.1, what they're doing is now they're using the fourth channel um, and now if you have six channels, you have six gigabits per channel and you have four channels, you are already at 24 gigabits per channel. The next thing is they're going to increase the bandwidth that they're going to drive down each channel from six to 12 uh, maximum, which is where you get the 48. Does this, so this means that you may have some cables that um, a short cable, say you have a very good short one meter or two meter cable. Right now it is certified for 18 gigabits. It does not mean that that cable cannot move up and support um, 12. So it's a, so you don't know that. It's not certified to do it, but it's a very good chance that those shorter cables could possibly handle a higher bandwidth. The inside of the cable has not been changed. It's just what the ends of the, what's going, what is coming out of the, the ends of the cable that has changed. So there's a good chance that if you have a very good cable from companies like AudioQuest, Metra, high-end ones that, um, that support 18 at shorter lengths, there is a very good chance that that will work, okay? 
So it doesn't mean that it has to be certified um, to work. Certification gives you and your customers peace of mind. All right, that's what the difference is. It's certified to support all of the features down the that will go all down the pipeline, and it will support 48 gigab um, gigabits per second for uncompressed 60 and 120. If I have a high speed cable, that high C cable may support 48. It's just not certified to support it. Okay. So it doesn't mean older tech, older cables can't do it. It just has not been tested to do it. Eventually the cable manufacturers are going through and getting their cables tested and you will know quickly which ones you already have that it will probably still work. So if you look at this, there's a whole bunch of different um, uh, things or, or different rates of signals and different um, uh, resolutions and bandwidths that can actually be supported by 2.1. We have been talking a lot about um, 4K uh, 120, which is down here, oh, and um, an 8K uh, 60, which is over there. But if you look, this can support um, using a type of compression all the way up, 2.1 can support all the way up to 10K 120. So hopefully um, it'll be a while before we have to go through this 2.1 thing again. Oh, by the way, the 10K 120, um, the, the ones with in red are gonna require some, a type of compression, but all types, all sources and all displays will be able to understand and utilize this compression. So um, uh, if you're a 2.1 device. So guess what? Hopefully we won't be having these discussions about 2.1 or, or, or 3.0 cables um, for a long, 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 long time. Hopefully I have a flying car before I start talking about HDMI 3.0. All right, so we, we went back to this. You can utilize, so the points I wanna get across to you, you can utilize your older devices, your older cables, with a two point with 2.1 components together in one system. The main thing you must have in order to make sure that you can continue a long life, a long usable life for your Denon AVRs or anybody's AVRs is the AVR and the TV needs to support eARC. Um, by the way, no more, never, ever, ever, ever use a Toslink optical cable to go between your TV and your receiver. Those optical cables that you would use, those little cheap, the old school optical cables, most of them will not pass surround sound from your TV's internal streaming services to the receiver. So you have Atmos and all these great um, surround sound formats in your Disney Plus or in your, um, your Netflix or maybe your upcoming um, 8K streaming service. But if you use an optical cable, you get stereo. All right. So do not do that. Um, make sure that you use eARC, um, the eARC output of the receiver plugged into the eARC input of the TV and use eARC. A lot of installers used to be used to not like ARC audio return channel because it was com combined with a thing called CEC, consumer electronics control. It basically the TV controlled everything down the pipeline and, and, and installers don't want their control systems to control everything in, 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 the, in the house. They don't want the TV messing with their control system. Now on most TVs, almost every single TV and almost every single high-end receiver, you can separate eARC or audio return channel from CEC. So now you don't have, you can use ARC without worrying about it screwing with your, with your AV system, okay? So that's, an, uh, that's a good thing. The next thing people ask me is, well, is it gonna be confusing because the customer um, turns the, um, if I'm, um, turns the input knob on the receiver to pick between my Roku, my Blu-ray my Blu and everything else, and the TV's on HDMI number one. And then when I wanna watch a game, I gotta switch the TV to HDMI number two. Um, yeah, you will have to do that unless the customer has, or unless you have a nice control system. Right now, when I hit watch TV, it's, it turns the receiver on, switches to the Roku input, and, and tells the, 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 the TV to go to HDMI number one, and it goes right down the line. All I'm gonna do when I get my gaming system is I'm going to basically go back into my control system and now say, when I watch a game, 
switched to HDMI um, HDMI number two, and when um, and everything else that I'm playing TV switched to HDMI number one. So once you put that in the control system, the experience is just as seamless as it was before, but the customer um, gets the best of both worlds. The gaming system is most likely going to be next to the TV because you want to have your controllers there. You want to change the disc. You want to be able to do things with it. Um, everything else can be in a rack 50 feet away in a closet, but you don't want your game system there because you want to put your hands on it. So this is normally not going to be a big deal for most customers. Um, some more things. The length of the cable matter. You can have a great cable. Okay, and and at, and as Greg asked, what is the length supported by a 2.1 cable? Great, George. We don't know because they're just starting to test those cables. We know. I do know right now that if I look at 18 gigabits, after you get past about 18 feet, most um, passive copper HDMI cables struggle to support 18 gigabits. So length has a um, a um, has a major impact on the bandwidth that can be supported. So, but I will tell you that if you have a good three meter or two meter um, high quality 18 gigabit cable from a reputable company, there's a good chance that that cable will, um, will support the bandwidth required to look at and enjoy a 2.1 source. It just will not. Be certified. Um, some other things I want to point out. We talked about the importance of eARC. Um, many HD base T extenders may may pass video, but they will not. Most of them, them do not support eARC. It's not. They weren't even thinking about ARC or eARC when they developed these things. It was more about sending video than it was um, sending um, audio return channel. So there are some high end ones that support audio return channel and there's, um, but there's a lot of them do not. So if you're using extenders to put, instead of using cop, um, cables, copper cables, you're using cat five or cat six to run HDMI long distances, talk to the, talk to the, um, the manufacturers of the extenders you're using and make sure they at least support 18 gigabits per second, um, 18 in, 18 out, and that they support eARC. You will have, the customer will have to pay a premium for them, but they will last a lot longer in the system than ones that will not. Nobody wants to be able to plug plugs a game system into the TV, and then all of a sudden it won't send the audio back to the receiver. It sucks. I know because it happened to me um, using just regular HDR sources. Um, use higher end extenders. Buyer beware. Copper is still the best way to go. Um, so when you talk about it, there's different ways. To, um, to get longer runs. So we know that maybe three feet, six feet will work on a standard passive HDMI cable, but it won't, we don't know because it has not been certified, it has not been tested. You, you're gonna have to just try it. Um, and hopefully your, some of your better cables will work. Um, the same thing applies to these longer um, active HDMI cables. These are actually active copper cables. Um, and it says fiber optic, but it's actually active opera, um, um, copper cables. Basically, there's a little amplifier in there to boost the signal and increase the bandwidth capability of these cables for long distances. These are some examples. Do they? Um, um, I would talk to your um, to these manufacturers to see um, uh, for more information about these cables. But we know, um, based on my experience, that these cables normally will support when I'm tested when I've tested them, 18 gigabits at longer, up to 50 meters. Moving on from there, even better or what are called opti um, active optical cables. So instead of copper in the cables, these actually have um, fiber optics in the cable. And these cables can support really long distances at a bandwidth exceeding 18. A lot of these already have been tested to do at least 24. So, so you can already are at 24 at meters well, uh, at really, really long distances. So maybe if you're only going 30 feet, these cables may have enough bandwidth to support 2.1 gaming at 4K 120. But I can't say they are because they have not been tested and certified yet. So please talk to the cable manufacturers. The ones that we do know 
that are that you can utilize are what are called um, um, the, there's um, you if you pull fiber they call it fiber optic cable it's this dedicated cable you see here um, through the wall this is already rated to support a hundred gigabits per second double what HDMI 2.1 specifies and there are actually balance available for these cables so you basically pull this in the wall and you use these balance. You may have to upgrade the balance in the future, the, the, uh, the, the transmitter and the receiver in the future, but that cable in that wall is, is good. So you never have to worry about it. So fiber is always the best way to go. So, so um, copper, hopefully, if it'll work. If not, go to a um, act, um, active copper. If not after that, go to a fiber optic cable. And if after that, go to raw fiber. Because if you pull two pieces of this thin wire in the wall, there is no way you're going to have to worry about it going back in the future and, um, and not being prepared for 2.1. So um, we talk about all these cables. I suggest this to eliminate heartache and frustration. Regardless of the solution you're using right now, you should test your cables, every single cable, whether it's... Um, um, using a um, HDMI extender and balance, or whether it's using a long piece of copper or active copper or fiber cables, you should test them before you put them in the box, before you put them in the wall, because it's a lot easier to fix a problem um, to test your 20 cables before you set the whole system up and one cable is bad and you're trying to go back and, and figure it out. So these testing systems are, can be expensive, um, the least expensive one on here, I believe, is the, is the Neridio Fox and Hound, and I believe that's about $2,500 for that system. But at, at, uh, at Denon and Marantz, we still have a solution for you. We have an HDMI diagnostics tool that's built into all of our Denon and Marantz AVRs. It's a little that if you plug the cable into the HDMI out, um, in and the monitor out, there is a, a button press and that you will put into the receiver and it will send out, um, it will run a diagnostics on the cable. And you can do things such as limit the EDID or the HDCP if you have video problems. So there's actually a really good diagnostics tool built into the receivers. Now this is only testing the 18 HDMI 2.0B, but at least you know the cable can do that. Um, and hopefully in the future, we shall see when you have that better source, maybe that cable will support. But at least test your cables to do 18, um, because if they can't do 18, they definitely can't do 48, all right? Um, a few more things, bigger is not always better. We have a habit of when we look at these systems and we see all the different settings in a game system, we wanna turn everything up. Oh man, um, I wanna do 4K 120 at 12 bit color with 444, those are the biggest numbers. Well, if you do that, you're wasting, you may not get a better picture, you're just adding a bigger load to your system. So for example, we look at this chart and I go back here to um, 4K um, 24P, which is what um, 4K Blu-ray is. Well, 4K Blu-ray is 420 um, 10-bit color. Um, and that's um, at 30 frames per second, that is 8.9 gigabits. Um, most 4K Blu-rays are actually 24. So it's actually in this, it's actually about set a little bit more than seven, um, a little less than eight gigabits per second on a 4K Blu-ray today, all right? Now I can go in to my OPPO and turn everything up, 12-bit color and 444, and all I'm doing is, and I make the file 13. What lived on the disk is 4K. Uh, what lives on the disk is 4K 420. So you turning it up is not going to make the picture any better. Um, and, and all you're doing is making the load harder um, to send down your pipeline. All right. So let me give you an analogy or something you should think about. Here's two signals. One of them has 444 and one of them has 422. The 444 is a bigger file. And, but it only has 16 million color shades. The 10-bit one, that's 422, is a smaller file, and it has a billion colors. So even though the file is smaller, the picture is better. Subsampling is another way to make your files bigger. And a lot of times people want to turn it up because it looks cool, but don't do it. It's, it's the same as if you bought your wife a diamond ring. All you're doing is taking out a little box 
and putting it in a shipping container. It's harder to move from point A to point B, but it doesn't make the diamond any shinier or look any better. So a lot of times, do not turn it up. Your TV, if you see all the colors from your TV and from your display, that is because you're seeing 444. The TV will automatically, or your display will automatically take the 420 and make it 444. What's gonna do a better job upsampling colors? A $7,000 TV or a $50 Roku? Let the TV do the color subsampling up conversion. You will get a better picture and the load on your system will be less and those cables, may, you may be to get a little bit more out of the cables that you already have, all right? So don't do it. And last but not least, you try to get the customer to buy fiber, he says no. You try to get the customer to buy an, a, a better optical cable to run in the wall, he says no. Um, at least say, um, let me put some conduit in the wall because it's a lot easier to pull that old wire out if there's conduit. So conduit is your friend that if you need to update in the future, you can actually update. So let me answer some questions. And um, for those who wanna leave, please do so. We will actually make sure that I answer, um, we post the answers to the questions, but let me go through here and we'll answer some questions as we go along. We already talked about what's the minimum length of an HDMI 2.1 cable, maximum realistic length. It all depends on what you're using. If you're using fiber, um, you'd be able to go 50 or 60 feet, you know, 70, 80 meters, depending on the fiber solution that you're using. So it depends on what type of cable and, um, and but all of that has not been tested or certified yet because they're just starting to test right now. Um, Bob, we talked about good cables, some audio, uh, audio and video files say that cables must be certified and have the hologram, um, Okay, if you looked at the picture I showed you, it had a little badge that said ultra high speed. That, get, that is that hologram certification. That gives you peace of mind. So if you look at better cables by companies such as Metra, um, AudioQuest, and all of the better cable companies, you will see that little logo on the cable. So it says that it is certified for that length. But beware. A lot of times they will say something um, the brand X's Schmeckman cables are certified ultra high speed, but in the small print, it'll say four links up to eight feet. So you have to make sure that each cable that you buy has that certification, not just the line of cables. So, um, so you may have um, the cable line, the Schmeckman, may be certified ultra HD, but it doesn't mean the link that you're buying is certified to be um, um, ultra high speed or even high speed, 18 gigabits. So you need to test them, all right? Uh, and then of course, somebody always asks me, has the, um, um, when will the new uh, Denon receivers um, that which such as the successors for receivers such as the 3600 be announced? Good question. If I tell you, I would be the former training manager or former, tra former training director for um, Sound United, but I will tell you that we are looking at launching um, HDMI 2.1 enabled devices. And as soon as I find out, believe me, I will host another group of webinars talking about what you can and what you cannot do with those particular um, devices. So um, thank you guys very much. There's one more thing I wanna point out. It, um, we're gonna be sending out a survey about this um, training. Um, and if you liked it, great. My name is Phil Jones. Um, and if you have um, any additional questions, you can email me and I will make sure that I try to answer them. Um, uh, somebody asked, uh, like, for example, will the 6500 support HDMI 2.1? The Denon X6500 is going to be a, is an HDMI 2.0B device. So you have auto low latency and eARC. The only devices that will be that the only Denon and Marantz pieces that are going to be upgradable that are available right now are the 8500 Denon and the X and, and the um, AV and the AV8805 Marantz Pre-Pro. Everything else has um, some 2.1 um, 
features in it, but they will not be certified or upgradable to um, certified HDMI 2.1, all right? One more thing before I let you guys go. There are some, if you enjoyed these, um, this, this um, session, there are, we are also hosting additional sessions um, to expand your knowledge, help you maybe grow your sales or your knowledge. If you're, even if you're a customer and you're doing kind of a DIY. We talk about how to, um, such as how to convert, how to um, conduct virtual home consultations. Sometimes you just can't get in the house, but you still want to go in and see where the screen is going to be mounted and determine how much you're going to kind of, you could probably charge for that install in that project. And you can do that remotely and we'll provide tips on how to do that. The next thing is um, smart remote management. That's the ability to monitor your systems from a remote location. So if a person has a problem, instead of rolling a truck, you can sit there someplace else with a hamburger and fix the problem and help the customer figure it out without having to go to the customer's home. And then finally, advancements in multi-zone high resolution distribution. Um, we have a lot of high resolution distribution options on our Denon and Marantz pieces, our HEO system, and we also just announced support for Rune. Our product, a lot of our Denon and Marantz products are Rune tested, and we're going to talk about those and how those services work together and how to get the most from it when you set those systems up. So thank you guys very much for your time. Um, and if you have uh, um, any more questions, um, please um, be, feel free to drop me an, e an email at my email address here, and I will try to answer those questions, and we will actually share that at the very end. And hopefully I will see you on the next WebEx.